This is hot, guys. Good morning. Welcome to the Miller Center, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. To any new folks out there, welcome to the Miller Center. To the uh, regulars, welcome back. Uh, we've got a very, very busy September ahead of us, so I think most of you guys have seen that. I want to, uh, I'm up here just a few minutes early today because I want to uh, talk about a special event that I am helping plan. Uh, for those of you who walked in on the ground floor this morning, you maybe saw some new artwork hanging in the Newman Pavilion. We have, and if you did not, please go down these stairs and exit that way so you can take a look. We have eight original Patrick Oliphant caricatures that Patrick Oliphant drew in this very room 10 years ago when he did a forum here. So 10 years later, we finally framed them and have them up. We hung them up. We hung them up. Well, he did them for his event, and then they were sort of sitting in the library for about five years until I rediscovered them. So we went up, they went up this week, though, because in three weeks, the university is having a special celebration of Patrick Oliphant. He and his wife, Susan, donated their archive to the university last year. The Miller Center is a co-sponsor of that exhibition, and as our part, we'll be doing an event on grounds on the 24th. Uh, Patrick is getting older, and he will not be participating, but he will be there in the audience. But we have a fantastic panel of two panels, really, a group of historians from Johnson, Nixon, Carter, and Reagan uh, specialties. Uh, and they're going to be looking at Oliphant's work from that period. And then we have a group of practitioners, our very own Mary-Kate Carey, who is back there. Hi, Mary-Kate. We'll be talking about um, the Bushes. Phil Zelico will also be up there, and Chris Liu as well. Um, this event sold out in about 24 hours. We really want you guys to be able to come to this, so we have moved this event to the Newcomb Theater. If you have... Uh, registered already, fantastic. If you tried to register before and couldn't, we have 200 more seats available. So as of this morning, our website has it open again. You can go on and register. And um, we, hope, we hope as many of you who want to go can make it. It's the 24th of September, Newcomb uh, Theater, 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And then now I get to my normal business you've got one of these, please turn it off. Silence it or make it quiet somehow. Thank you very much. We're going to get started in just a few seconds. Hi, how are you? <laughs> 
good morning. Um, many people in politics have a Barbara Bush story, and I've got one too. In October 1988, I was a 23-year-old advanced person on the presidential contest between George Herbert Walker Bush and Michael Dukakis. Given my last name and that I went to work on for, went on to work for Bill Clinton, I guess you can guess who I worked for. Uh, that's right, as an advanced person, my job was to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, I started out in motorcade, uh, which for a 23-year-old kid from New Jersey via UVA is the best job in the world because you're dealing with cars and limousines and buses and station wagons and the candidate and their staff and their entourage and reporters and you get to see it all in bright lights. Um, so one night I'm sitting in a hotel in East Texas preparing for an event the next day. I had been assigned to work for then vice presidential candidate Lloyd Benson. Uh, and if you remember in the history of the Bushes, they go way back in Texas to actually running against the Bensons uh, for Congress. There was a double problem. We were in Texas and by October we knew we were gonna lose. <laughs> and the Bensons didn't like the Bushes very much. So this was a problem. So I turn on the TV and there's Barbara Bush and she's being interviewed, I think by Barbara Walter. I only remember one question and one answer from that interview. But uh, both the question and the answer say a lot about politics then and politics today and the Bushes. The question was simple. If George Bush loses, what does he do? And Barbara Bush paused and she said, George is a very mature man. He'll have his head high, his shoulders back, his chest out. He'll walk out of the Naval Observatory and get in his car and drive away. And then she paused and she said, none of the rest of us will get in that car. The man hasn't driven his own car in eight years. <laughs> So as an advanced person, I loved her immediately because she knew what we did uh, and what that allowed her and her husband to do. It's a pleasure to welcome you all back. It's a terrific day in my five years at the Miller Center. I don't think we've had a football kickoff and a Miller Center kickoff on the same day. So uh, for those of you wearing orange, thank you. Um, we're really excited about hosting you all, and all for this. This is the kickoff of the 2019-2020 season. It's gonna be a big year for the Miller Center and for the country. Um, we've got a lot going on, particularly with a uh, presidential election coming. I sent a note out last week where I laid out some of the things we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, the economy, particularly uh, if there is a recession looming and also issues of healthcare, which always feature in presidential elections. American identity, the issues of immigration have been important in this presidential cycle and um, we expect them to continue as well as race and religion and with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the role of women in politics. Um, how our democracy engages in statecraft. Next week, we are blessed to have Condoleezza Rice along with our own Philip Zelico as a kickoff for a series of, of events on that topic. We'll have a particular focus on China, technology and trade. Throughout the year, we have some new additions and our faculty helping us focus on those issues that we're quite excited about. And then finally, the presidency in a constitutional system with a particular focus on the vulnerabilities of our electoral process and the validity of the outcome. Um, and uh, with that, I wanna start turning to today's event and to Susan Page, who will discuss her newly penned chronicle of First Lady Barbara Bush's uh, fascinating life. But before getting into that topic, Susan is one of America's leading political journalists, and she not, writes not just about presidential politics and policy, but also the broader political challenges facing the nation. Just last week, she uh, penned an article, I'm told with two interns, but I wanted to confirm that she wrote the lead, which she did. Which really lays out the challenge, and the, the lead for the article was, Americans are facing the 2020 presidential election with a dominant feeling dread. Um, she and her colleagues went on to write, if the candidate they support loses nearly four in 10 Americans, no confidence that the election had been conducted in a fair and square way, setting up what could be a debate over the legitimacy of the next president. Um, so bringing us back to that, meta, to that story that I told and to Barbara Bush, what is so telling to me about that moment was, regardless of what happened in the election, we could expect the losing presidential candidate to leave the scene. And a question we will be looking at at the Miller Center is, what if that's not the case? 
Before we get started, I want to introduce a couple of people. First, our fantastic moderator. Uh, you all know uh, Miller Center's own Professor Barbara Perry, who is the Gerald Belisles Professor here at the Miller Center. Barbara, too, has penned a book on a First Lady, Jackie Kennedy, and she's writing about another one right now. Um, that first book piqued her interest in First Ladies throughout our country's history, Dolly Madison, Hillary Clinton, both Laura and Barbara Bush, and she's now working on a book about the relationship between JFK and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, which is a really exciting book that, uh, that Barbara will mostly be on leave in the spring. We will keep pulling her back in for one small thing or another. Uh, the second person I want to... <laughs> Second person I want to introduce is standing at the back of the room, one of our newest colleagues, Kelly McCaskill, who is our new chief advancement officer and the head of the Miller Center Foundation. Um, Kelly comes to us from the nursing school where she led their foundation uh, and their advancement team. And before that, she's been in advancement and development for public policy at George Washington University's Elliott School, as well as in issues like healthcare and the arts at George Mason and the Corcoran Gallery and other places. She is a Wahoo too. Do I see orange? I don't got with the Klieg lights, thank you. Uh, she uh, has an undergraduate degree in art history and French. Uh, but that liberal arts uh, foundation was added to with a, uh, an MBA. So she's a terrific combination of the spoken word and getting the dollar and cents right, to, dollars and cents right around here, which is uh, something we're looking for her leadership on. So with that, I hand it over to Barbara and Susan, and thank you both, and thank you all for coming. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you all for being here on this opening day of Miller Center Forums. Uh, I want to start by thanking the people who put these forums together, uh, starting with Christina, uh, who's in the back and standing next to Saqib as well, another part of our team here, um, Alfred, uh, Mike, Woody, Kevin, Reed. It, if it weren't for those people, we wouldn't be sitting here on the stage mm -hmm. because as soon as I thought we might have an opportunity to have Susan Page come here, I reached out to Christina and she said, oh, absolutely, we must have Susan Page come. But if it weren't for that team, uh, these would not happen. Um, Susan was telling me in the green room before we came in that uh, two kinds of books are selling these days, <laughs> okay? One, uh, anything on Donald Trump, <laughs> for or against. Uh, and the other is women who were underestimated or who perhaps have uh, gone on in history or memory. So I don't think Eleanor Roosevelt was ever underestimated, but I don't think people think enough about her today. So I was glad to hear Susan say that uh, as I get ready to launch uh, onto that book. But I just want to say a word about a, a woman who's no longer with us, but I think her spirit is. And many of you knew Elizabeth Scott. And if you came in through this back door here today and you look to your left, if you didn't look to your right as you leave, there's a beautiful oil painting of Elizabeth Scott. Um, she was the founding mother of the Miller Center. Uh, if it weren't for uh, Elizabeth Scott, we might not be here at all as the Miller Center. And the beautiful garden in the back is also uh, in her honor. Uh, I knew her long before I came to the Miller Center. She was a proud graduate of Sweet Bar College where I taught for 21 years. She was in the graduating class of 1930-something. Uh, and um, I got to know her that way. And she was a lovely lady. She passed away this summer at 104, wow. the same age as Rose Kennedy, uh, and was a great matriarch in her own right. So I do think of her as the founder of the Miller Center. So we want to just take a moment to, to think of her and thank her. So, Susan. Uh, Susan, I had been reading for years and years and years, and so appreciating all of her reporting on Washington and around the world. Uh, and I particularly love her observations when I see her on television. If I hear, we're going to be joined by Susan Page, <laughs> I don't leave the room. If I turn on the TV and she's there, I don't leave the room. Because I know she's going to base her observations on facts, uh, on straight shooting, on her down-to-earth style and persona, and I just learned something about her that may explain her down-to-earth <laughs> style and persona. I just discovered she was born in Wichita, Kansas. So she is truly, first of all, I guess a Jayhawk, so rock <laughs> chalk, uh, but she's also from middle America, and now the best fact that I found out about her of all was she, um, she was born in the same hospital as Jim Lair, our wonderful board member, but I guess just a little bit after Jim. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously it has produced two great journalists and um, 
we're just delighted to have her. Now, having said that, I was especially thrilled when she called me or emailed me a few years ago. I think we had done some interviews together. Mm -hmm. But she said, I'm going to, I'm writing this biography of Barbara Bush. And she said, I'm going to be in Charlottesville. And I've seen your biography of Rose Kennedy, another matriarch of a political dynasty. Could I stop by and see you? And I said, absolutely. I would just be delighted to meet you in person. So we sat in my office. And she told me about the book that she was going to write. Then we crossed paths. A few months later, um, thanks to Mary Kay Carey, who's here today, who's a speechwriter for Bush 41 and knew Mrs. Bush very well, uh, and has been, and we hope will be again, a senior fellow with us. Um, so Mary Kay invited me to come down to the Bush Library uh, in College Station for the 20th anniversary of that library. And so I passed that word on to Susan, so we met there. And now I have to tell my Barbara Bush story. I only met Barbara Bush once, and that was just six months before she passed. And I was sitting in the green room with Mary Kate. Our panel was ready to go out and talk about Bush 41. And it so happened I had a slide in my PowerPoint about Mrs. Bush and the oral histories that we had done here on her husband. And she was mentioned and very much admired. And so she, she wasn't a scooter at that time. She scooted up in her electric scooter to the door of the green room. And there she stopped. And everybody on my panel knew her. Mary Kate knew her, and Jeff Engel knew her, John Meacham, of course, knew her. And they all raced out to speak to the great lady. And I'd never met her, so I thought, I'm not going to go there. I, I didn't want to do that. So they all spoke to her, and there was great laughter. And then they all came back into the green room, and Mrs. Bush just continued to sit and look into the green room. So I thought, oh, this is my chance. And I went out. I said, oh, Mrs. Bush, it's just such an honor to meet you. And I thought maybe, since she didn't know me, our one connection would be our name. So I said, I'm Barbara Perry. And then I said, and at the Miller Center, we did your husband's oral history. And she just wasn't responding. And I don't <laughs> think it was because she couldn't. She just, I was not connecting. I was not connecting with her at all. And so I thought, all right, I need to take my leave. And I, I thought, I'll say what I say to everyone we interview in oral history. And I think this is true of First Ladies as well. Thank you for your service to our country. And she trained those steely, blue-gray eyes on me. And she said, baloney. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I said to Russell Riley, my colleague, when I got back here, I said, Russell, I think I blacked out. I, somehow I ended up. <laughs> I ended up back in the green room, but I don't remember how. And so as a professor, of course, I had to get in the last word, so I told that story on her. She came to the panel, and she sat in the first row in her scooter, and I told that story, and there were about 300 people in that audience and got the same kind of response. And people would, of course, ask the inevitable question, well, what did she look like when you told that story on her? And I said, I couldn't bear to look, so I don't know. She, but she didn't attack me afterwards. So that, to <laughs> that you me, know of. that I know of, that I know of. But um, with that, we're going to turn to Susan and and approach this book the way we we like to do these in forums now, and that is have our author speak for 15 or 20 minutes, give you an overview of the book, how they approach the book, the high points. Then we'll chat, she and I, for 15 or so minutes. And then we want to leave plenty of time for your questions. So be thinking of those, and we'll turn the microphones uh, over to you for our last uh, 20 minutes or so. So with that, Susan, oh, welcome to the Miller Center. Thank you. Well, it's, it's great to be here. I remember very well, <clears throat> my, the call to Barbara was one of the first calls I made when I started to work on this book. It was on. In fact, on November 15th, 2017, that I sat down with you, which was almost exactly two years ago. Um, and I don't know what you remember about that uh, meeting, but what I remember is how stupid my questions were to you. Exactly. Uh, it was like, you know, I've signed this contract to write a, write a book. What, what do I do next? And uh, how in the world do you do research at a presidential live, in presidential archives, something I had never done? She tried to explain finding aids to me, which is a subject <laughs> that is I still find that kind of perplexing. So I'm... Barbara, I'm very, I'm grateful for your tuition-free advice <laughs> that you gave me. It was, uh, it was so helpful as I embarked on this project uh, uh, that was, uh, was like using a new set of, of muscles. And it's, it's such an honor to be here at the, the Miller Center. The oral histories here are such a treasure for journalists and for historians. And in fact, some of the quotes in the book about Barbara Bush came from oral history interviews here at the Miller Center. One Bush 80 had been RNC chairman, he had been agricultural secretary for the elder George Bush, 
And he died before I started working on this book, and it was by the oral history interview he gave, which talked about how people underestimated Barbara Bush, that I would get his voice in the story. So I'm grateful to the Miller Center. And finally, I'm grateful for all of you for showing up and for making last night's nightmare that I would be speaking to an empty room not come true. <laughs> so so when, I, when I decided to write this book, I did something that was uh, either uh, brilliant or stupid. And I will let you decide which it was. I uh, got an agent. I wrote a proposal for the book. I presented it to publishers. I signed a contract. And only then did I make my first contact with Barbara Bush to see if she would cooperate. So brilliant or stupid. Here's my reasoning. <laughs> my reasoning was if I went to Barbara Bush, who I'd interviewed over the years, over previous campaigns, if I went to her before I was committed uh, to this project, and she said, no, I won't cooperate with you, that would have been pretty discouraging, and maybe I wouldn't have been brave enough to go ahead and do it. But I was always also worried that if she said, yes, I'll cooperate with you, that she would think she had some sway over what I would write. And I didn't want to do an authorized biography. I wanted to do a piece of journalism. So I took this leap of faith and signed a contract. And then I sent emails, for letters, but I sent the letters by email to her and to George W. Bush and to Jeb Bush, all three of them I had interviewed over the years in politics, saying I was embarking on this project and would they help. And the response from Jeb Bush, I don't know if you know how quick he is to respond to an email, as was his governor is today. The Jeb Bush, I got a response from Jeb Bush within 15 minutes that was three words long. It was, does mother know? <laughs> <laughs> and about a week later, about 10 days later, I got a response from Barbara Bush in which she said I could come to Houston and interview her once. So this was uh, great news but put a lot of pressure on that interview. I went to Houston with a commitment only for a single interview. And I knew it was possible I would see her again, but I knew it was possible that this was my one shot at doing an interview with her. And it was as though I had arrested her and were grilling her for some potential crime. This interview was so intense. We covered so much ground. I made her talk about a series of tough topics because I was concerned if I didn't do it then, I would never have another chance. And it was a really good interview. I mean, it was if she was really, as Mary Kate knows, she was, a, she was a candid person who said what she thought. And at the end of the first interview, I said, this was so great. Can I have a second interview? And she said, yes. And at the end of the second interview, I said, can I have a third interview? You can see where this is going. She said, yes. And in the end, I had five extended interviews with her in Houston during the final six months of her life. And in fact, she had agreed to a sixth interview, I had gone to Texas to do the sixth interview, uh, but the night before we were scheduled to see each other for a sixth time, she fell, she broke her back, she went into the hospital, and she never really recovered. So the fifth interview was the last time I saw her. In, in the first interview, she said, do not even ask me about my diaries, you cannot see them. And um, I could understand that. You know, I've never kept diaries, but if I did, I would not let a reporter see them. Uh, <laughs> at, the, at the third interview, I asked her if I could see her diary entries just that related to Reza Gorbachev, because her determination to cultivate Reza Gorbachev as a friend was one of the untold stories in her life that I was very interested in. She played a bigger role in the end of the Cold War than has ever been acknowledged because of her calculated effort to diffuse a difficult situation that had existed between Nancy Reagan and Reza Gorbachev. So I asked, I thought those were diary entries maybe she would be willing to share. So I asked if she would let me read just those diary entries and she said she would think about it, which I assume meant no. <laughs> and at the end of the fifth interview, I stood up and I said what I always said, can I have another interview? And she said yes. And I said, in what turned out to be our, the final words we said to each other. I said, uh, you know, I'd ask you about seeing diary entries that relate to Reza Gorbachev. Have you thought about that? And she said, yes, I've thought about it. You can see them. You can see them all. You can see all my diaries. I know. 
So I said the, the worst possible thing. I said, I was so surprised. I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so my advice is if someone gives you a huge, enormous gift, do not say, hey, don't you want to take this back? <laughs> but she said she was sure because, of course, she was always sure. She was, uh, she was a risk taker. Uh, she took a leap of faith in letting me read her diaries. That was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary gesture on her part. She started keeping diaries in 1948 when she was a young mother in Texas. She made the final entry in her diary 12 days before she died. So it was a off and on, kept in different ways, but a, really a contemporaneous account of what she was thinking about all that was happening to her in her long and interesting life. You know, it's great that stories. I wonder, does anyone else here have their own Barbara Bush stories? You've met her. You, uh, you, so there's one. Mary Kate, you, yeah. You, you wore her bathing suit once <laughs> in Kenny Von Court. That is a story you must have her tell you because it is horrifying. Yes. So here's another one. So there are, there are multiple, several people in the room who actually knew Barbara Bush. But let me ask you this. Even if you never met her, how many of you felt like you knew her? In, in, in covering, I've covered the last 10 presidential campaigns. In seven of those, Barbara Bush played a personal role, which is extraordinary. And in talking to voters, voters generally felt like they knew Barbara Bush. Uh, she was seen as, I think, accessible and down to earth and a wonderful grandmother. And everybody commented on her cloud of white hair and the fact that she was, she was always wearing that triple strand of, of fake pearls. And what interested me in looking back at her life was that I thought they had such a one-dimensional picture of Barbara Bush. Because Barbara Bush was, in fact, a wonderful grandmother and a warm and down-to-earth person. But she was also uh, smart and uh, caustic uh, and funny and blunt. And she could be mean. She was mean to Barbara. There was a time she was. <laughs> There was a time she was kind of mean to me. She was influential. She was consequential. She made a difference. And those were the reasons that I wanted to do this book. When I did the first, uh, the first draft of the book, the first chapter was initially the 1988 election, the election. White House, the culmination of what was almost a lifetime uh, ambition. And when I finished the book, I realized that that was the wrong way to start it. That the fact the defining event for George Bush's life. It was not the defining event for Barbara Bush's life. The defining event for Barbara Bush's life was the illness and death of her daughter Robin when Robin was three and Barbara Bush was 29. Uh, and that was, and six, that was six months from her life that made her harder and tougher. It made her care less about what people, she had survived the worst thing that could have happened to her. And it also made her softer on the inside. It made her more empathetic. It increased her understanding of people because when, when Robin was diagnosed with leukemia, a disease that neither she nor George Bush had ever heard of before, there was not a single case of someone surviving a diagnosis of leukemia. It was a death sentence. There were early trials going on at Sloan Kettering with kind of an early form of chemotherapy, which is where they took Robin and where she was treated uh, for six months and where she died. Uh, and this was, a, this was a case where the fact that Barbara Bush had ancestors who came over on the Mayflower, the fact that her father-in-law was a U.S. senator, the fact that she came from a family that had had money and power and position and social standing, the fact that her husband was a success as an oil man in Texas, none of that made any difference in what was going to happen to Robin. And when she spent those six months and the, at Sloan Kettering, she met all these other parents from circumstances so much less privileged than hers, and all of them were exactly in the same boat 
and that there was nothing they could do to save their children. And this changed her forever. And it was a thread through her diaries. You know, in her diaries, she would note, this, was Robin's, this day was Robin's birthday, or this was the day that Robin died. Or she would wonder what Robin would look like when she met her in heaven. Uh, and it was a thread in, in other ways, too. During the, here, here's one of the extraordinary things that Barbara Bush did as First Lady. In her first 100 days at the White House, she arranged to go visit. She reached out to a place called Grandma's House, which still exists. At that point, it was pretty new. It was a home for infants with AIDS who had been abandoned by their families. And she went and she called, she had an aide call Grandma's house and arranged to go visit there. And she didn't, uh, she didn't make a speech and she didn't scold anybody. You know, this was a time when the Reagan administration had done very little on the exploding crisis that was AIDS. Um, all she did was take reporters and photographers with her. And when she was there, she chit-chatted with the two women who started Grandma's house, who still run it. She saw a baby named Donovan who was fussing in his crib, six-month-old baby. She picked up Donovan, she hugged him, and she made sure the photographers got pictures of her doing this. Because this was a time when many millions of Americans were afraid to have anything to do with someone who had AIDS. They were afraid to work alongside a coworker who had AIDS or to pick up a baby who had AIDS for fear that they would get AIDS if they did this. So she, this picture, I don't know how many, do, do any of you remember this picture of her holding Donovan? So she looks like it's the most natural thing in the world. She's hugging Donovan, she's rubbing his back. Her cheek is on his cheek. That was important. Uh, there was another picture that came out uh, from that same visit. Before, after she had met with, uh, the, with the grandma's house people and picked up Donovan, she met privately with a group of adults who had AIDS that the grandma's house had arranged for her to meet with. And in this closed meeting with adults who had AIDS, one of them, a man named Lou Toscani, said to her, everybody thinks the babies are blameless, but we need a hug too. And she said, I'll give you a hug, Lou. And she stood up and she gave Lou Toscani a hug. And when they came out to where the reporters and photographers were, she made a big point of giving Lou Toscani a hug. So there was a picture of her hugging a man who had AIDS. And that also had a big effect. You know, I think it's easy for us to forget in 2019 the stigma that then surrounded people who had AIDS. It was then not a violation of federal law to fire someone who had AIDS if their coworkers didn't want to work next to them. There was a, a huge stigma. And I think one reason this struck Barbara Bush so strongly, and one reason she continued her advocacy on AIDS for the rest of her life, was she told me in one of the interviews I did with her about the last time they brought Robin home to Midland, Texas. She was being treated at Sloan Kettering. It was clear that she wasn't going to get better. They brought her back. They brought Robin back to Midland so she could see her two brothers. Jeb and George W., so that she could see the relatives and friends and neighbors in Midland for one last time. And with tears in her eyes, Barbara Bush told me that some of her best friends refused to visit them because they were worried they would catch leukemia. So when Barbara Bush saw the stigma that surrounded people with AIDS, she saw that through Robin's eyes. And her advocacy on AIDS was often um, subtle and quiet. But when I interviewed George W. Bush for this book, he said that that was one reason he was interested in AIDS in Africa. And you know, whatever you think about other aspects of George W. Bush's presidency, the PEPFAR initiative is one that saved millions of lives. And another way, it resonated through a third generation, Barbara Bush, Barbara Pierce Bush, the granddaughter, her namesake, uh, as an adult started when she got out of school, started a, helped co-found a, a, a nonprofit called the Global Health Corps, which works around the world, often on issues with people with AIDS. So you think about Barbara Bush's reaction to the death of Robin, in the end helped save millions of people around the world who had AIDS and played a big part in changing public attitudes and compassion for people with AIDS.
Sp speaking of speaking of George W. Bush, you know, it was his election that made Barbara Bush such an historic figure because it meant that she was one of only two women who had been both the wife and the mother of presidents. And this being a university crowd, the other one was Abigail, Abigail Adams, <laughs> right? So when a reporter said this to Barbara Bush, you know, it's just you and Abigail Adams, she corrected the reporter and said, well, you know, Ra Ra Abigail Adams died before her son became president. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when George W. Bush was elected president, uh, his father said he was not going to offer advice unless asked for. He wasn't going to meddle in his son's presidency. There were times when I think all of us wished he had meddled a little more, <laughs> but he made that promise and he pretty much kept to it. And George W. Bush rarely asked his father for any advice. Barbara Bush did not make that promise. <laughs> and Barbara Bush felt free to praise her son when she thought he was doing well and to criticize him or call for changes when she thought he was making mistakes. And the issue on which they clashed most was the war in Iraq. Because Barbara Bush thought that he was listening to the wrong people. He wasn't listening to people like um, Brent Scowcroft, for instance, um, who had been the national security advisor for his father. He wasn't listening to Jim Baker, who had been the Secretary of State. Instead, he was listening to people like Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. Um, and she told her son that he was listening too much to Dick Cheney and his hawkish views on the Iraq War. And this, she, she weighed in so often and so loudly that one White House staffer told me that there was a time when you could, you were, could stand, you would, he was standing in the hallway outside the Oval Office with the doors, where the doors were shut, and you could hear them talking about the war in Iraq. Finally, George W. Bush told me he told her to cut it out that he was the president, he, Dick Cheney, the vice president, didn't have any special sway, that she should stop criticizing him for this. He was the president, he knew what he was doing, and then she uh, cut it out mostly. <laughs> she was, uh, as I said, blunt and funny and caustic and impatient. She was also scarred in ways that I think she kept pretty shielded. She was insecure throughout her life about her looks. That was a legacy of her mother who constantly criticized her for being overweight. Uh, in one of the interviews I said, what, what, what would you say the nicknames are? What are the nicknames that would characterize you and your siblings? And she said, well, Martha, my older, the older sister, Martha was the beautiful one. And Martha was in fact beautiful and was an, a model worked sometimes at a model, was on the cover of the college issue of Vogue uh, when she was going to Smith. So Martha's the beautiful one. Jimmy was the Pex bad boy. Jimmy was her older brother, constantly in trouble, but in a way that was sort of endearing. She said, Scott, who was her little brother, was the perfect one. And I interviewed Scott several times for the book, and he was really endearing. I mean, he, I can see why people would think he was the perfect one. And I said, well, what about you? What was your nickname? And she said, I was the little fat one. <laughs> and that was how she saw herself. She, she kept score. She nursed grudges. Uh, let me talk about just two grudges she nursed. One was with Nancy Reagan. You know, I covered the Reagan White House. I was working for Newsday then. And we knew that Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush were not best friends. But until I did this book, we, I don't think we realized that they were mortal enemies, <laughs> that they disliked each other almost from the first time they met, that Nancy Reagan didn't want George Bush on the ticket in 1980, that um, uh, she kept her husband, she tried delayed her husband's endorsement of George Bush when he was running in 1988, and in, that she, she would go to dinners and describe, refer to the Bushes as the shrubs, I know, not realizing that, of course, Barbara Bush had Washington wired so that at least two or three other people at the dinner would then call her and say that Nancy Reagan had done this. <laughs> but here was the most extraordinary story and a use of, good use of presidential archives, as Barbara trained me to do. Um, there was the, the hottest ticket in the Reagan White House of all eight years 
was the White House dinner for Prince Charles and Princess Di. Do you remember that, where Princess Di is dancing with John Travolta? So that was the best social event that the Reagans gave during their eight years. And when the first guest list, which we pulled from the Reagan Library, when the social secretary sent the first guest list to Nancy Reagan for that dinner, it said, guests for, for Prince Charles' dinner. President and Mrs. Reagan, Vice President and Mrs. Bush, and then it had suggested names. And Barbara Bush took a pen and crossed out the Bush's name. Uh, right. Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, yes. Nancy Reagan picked up the, her pen and crossed out the Bush's name. And when the social secretary saw this, she was alarmed. Um, now, Nancy Reagan had to invite the Bushes to state dinners by pro order of protocol, but Prince Charles was not a head of state, so that didn't apply. But Mike Deaver, who was then the deputy chief of staff for President Reagan and who had, was kind of in charge of relations with Nancy Reagan, called Nancy Reagan and said, Nancy, you can't not invite the vice president. And Nancy Reagan said, just watch me. <laughs> and in all the subsequent uh, memos, memos from the social state were going every day or two to Nancy Reagan, their names were crossed off in the second one. And then the social secretary put, had, would put a list of names to consider, and at the top of the list, she would put the bushes. But when the dinner was held, the bushes were not there. I know. It's like worth 32 bucks for that story alone, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and actually, in the picture section, we ran an image of that first guest list with Nancy Reagan slashing through the Bush's <laughs> name. Here's somebody else. This will stun you. Someone else Barbara Bush did not like, and that was Donald Trump. <laughs> Back to her, as early as 1990 in her diaries, she was uh, denouncing Donald Trump as a symbol of greed. And uh, she gossiped about him in her diaries. She was clearly kind of thought he was appalling. Um, and then, of course, he uh, denounced that he was so tough on Jeb Bush, her son, in the 2016 election. So she didn't much like that. She definitely didn't like it when Donald Trump won the election. She didn't like the way he was the direction he was taking the Republican Party. Um, in the first interview I did, I said, I know you don't like Donald Trump, but do you still think you're a Republican? And she said, yes, I'm still a Republican. And in the last interview I did, I said, you know, back in October you said you were still a Republican. Do you still think you're a Republican? And she said, no. I no longer think of myself as a Republican which is pretty extraordinary. The mother of a Republican president, the wife of a Republican president, a woman who had been a, a face, an important face of the Republican Party for decades, said she no longer thought she was a Republican. And in the last summer of her life in 2017, to, so she didn't make any secret about what she thought about Trump. That will surprise you too. So in 2017 in Kenny Bunkport, a friend gave her as a joke a Trump countdown clock. Do you know what those are? Little digital clock, and it has how many? It has how many days and hours and minutes and seconds are left in Donald Trump's first term. And she liked this quite a bit. <laughs> and she put it in uh, on a t on a little table in her bedroom in Kenny Bunkport that summer. And then when they went back to Houston after the season was over, she liked it so much she brought it with her, and she put it on her bedside table at their house in Houston, where it would be the first thing she saw in the morning and the last thing she saw at night. And it was there until the day she died. Before we go to Barbara's uh, questions and your, and your questions, um, I'll just mention one last thing, and that was uh, her final um, big conversation with her husband. In the, in the time I was interviewing her, she was getting sicker and sicker. She had congestive heart failure. She was increasingly dependent on oxygen, increasingly dependent on using a scooter. She could no longer um, walk with any security. Uh, she was mentally totally sharp, but her body was clearly giving out on her. And she was ready to die. Uh, and she was not afraid of dying, but she was afraid of dying before he died. And 
finally, uh, after she fell and broke her back and as her heart condition got worse, she no longer had the option of, of waiting until he died. Uh, to, her son, Neil, told me that um, at one point she was talking to him about just stopping feeding George Bush, that they would both just stop eating and that th way they could die together. And Neil said, well, how, how are you going to, won't he wonder why you're not feeding him anymore? <laughs> how exactly is that going to work? And she did not have an answer for that, so she didn't try that. But <laughs> two days before she died, um, she and George Bush were sitting together in the den of their house, which was a little den, it's kind of a TV place to watch TV, just off the living room of their house in Houston. And he said to her, I'm not going to worry about you, Barr. And she said to him, I'm not going to worry about you, George. So he gave her permission to die, and she gave him permission to live, and then they had a drink. He had a vodka martini, which he liked very much, and she had a bourbon, which she also liked very much. <laughs> she was, a, she was a, such a great person to, to be able to explore her life. I feel um, so privileged to have had this, had this happen. One thing she really hated, though, was the title of my book. So she didn't like the word matriarch, although she was certainly a matriarch. And she really hated the word dynasty because she thought it dripped with entitlement. And I said to her, OK, what would you title this book? And she said, The Fat Lady Sings Again. <laughs> well, you can see why I'm a charter member of the Susan Page <laughs> Fan Club, as well as the Barbara Bush Fan Club, because I, I realized after Barbara Bush had said what she said to me in College Station, I then that afternoon went to the panel that was consisted of about half of her 17 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And she came in, remember, she yeah. came into the auditorium on her scooter, and she flipped it around so she'd be speaking out <laughs> to the audience. And she said, oh, she said, George wanted to be here, but she said, he's upstairs in the apartment here at the library. <laughs> she said, he's come down with a case of the shingles. Um, but we have this big concert tonight to raise money for hurricane victims. Uh, two years ago, <coughs> and she said, and he wants to preserve his strength because he wants to go to be at that concert with all of the other living presidents, uh, non-incumbents, let's like say, um, <laughs> who were all there that night. And so for me, who studies the presidency, I was breathing their air, and I was so excited. It was as I was at a Beatles concert. All the presidents on stage. So George made it to that. But as she turned around and spoke to the audience, she said, okay, now the grandchildren are going to speak. And she said something like, I know they're going to make fun of me, or I know they're, I know they're going to attack me. So she knew that she was sort of the foil in the family. That, and, and so it does make one wonder, was she caustic? originally, and then people would make fun of her being caustic and, and joke about it. Um, but everyone had a good laugh, and she must have been so proud because those grandchildren are so impressive. And we have someone here who's related to one of those grandchildren. Um, so with that, let's talk about a few other topics before we turn the floor over to you all and have you ask your questions. Um, one thing, Susan, um, that you didn't mention was her campaigning, her, mm -hmm. her style of campaigning. Um, she certainly was following her husband through many campaigns from Congress successfully, House of Representatives, unsuccessful Senate campaign against Lloyd Benson, um, successful presidential campaign, an unsuccessful presidential campaign, an unsuccessful primary campaign uh, in 1980 against Ronald Reagan. So tell us about her own campaign style. How did that develop hmm. through the years in Texas when he was running for uh, other federal offices before the presidency? How did she participate in those early on? And then how was she campaigning for him as he moved up the ladder into the presidential, vice presidential, and then presidential realm again? So she was very present. I mean, she campaigned a lot with him. She was all in with George Bush. She adored George Bush. Anything George Bush wanted, she was willing to do. When he came, when she was, uh, when he had just gotten out of, uh, graduated from Yale um, and was trying to figure out what to do, he came back to their um, shotgun apartment in, in uh, that they were, the small place they were living in there and said, okay, I've decided we're going to move to Odessa, Texas. He didn't say, should we move there? Or what do you think about us moving there? He said, 
that he had decided, uh, in, and this was like, th I think in the manner of the day, um, often, that they were gonna move to Odessa, Texas. And she said, oh, I've always wanted to move to Odessa, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that no one has ever said that. <laughs> Uh, but she, so she was, she was a eager campaigner. She, but the, in, in, even in the 1980 campaign, there was a great nervousness by the campaign staff about whether she was an asset or a liability, which seems extraordinary now because she became much more popular than either her husband or her son. <laughs> but at the time, George Bush was running as a new generation of leaders against the elderly, aging Ronald Reagan. And she looked older than he did. She had stopped dyeing her hair. Uh, she would go to events, and these were events, uh, you know, people said to, this to me when I was covering the 80 campaign, is that his mother, people would think it was his mother, not his wife. Mm -hmm. So in the 1980 campaign, they did not feature her. She went and did events on her own, but I went through the small number of TV ads that the Bush campaign had in 1980. And uh, she was not featured in any of them. In the flyers that the campaign put out, um, some of them didn't even mention he was married. One of the, only one of them had a picture of her, and it had a picture of him looking, you know, charismatic, and and she was like in the background, kind of fuzzy, gazing at him. But it wasn't clear whether she was his wife or just a fan. <laughs> so they were they were not they were uh, in a way that was um, insulting to her and distressing to her, and her sister-in-law came to her and said, told her there had been a meeting where they talked about what to do about Barbara and that they decided she needed to dye her hair and she needed to dress better. And this was hugely wounding because it was a reminder of what her mother had said to her the whole time she was growing up. Fast forward to 1988 when she's definitely an asset. And then to 1992 where Bush is like trying to write her coattails back into the White House where America just really Found, fallen in love with her. They, I think they loved her down-to-earth quality, uh, her lack of pretension. Um, I mean, she was, um, she was, of course, such a huge asset for both her husband and for her son, George, and also for Jeb. You know, she was, in 2016, she was, um, what was she, 90 years old? And uh, she was not in good health. And Jeb had, was making a last stand in the New Hampshire primary. And she went to a, through a snowstorm in New Hampshire with her walker to campaign for him. So she was, she, you know, she adored her children and her husband, and she became an important campaign asset, but she did not start out that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it puts me in mind uh, the Jeb campaign that she had said earlier, famously, uh, <laughs> on a talk show or a morning news show, um, too many bushes. Uh, in politics, and she was seemingly not supporting Bush <laughs> in running for the Republican nomination in 2016. Uh, thoughts about that? So that was in 2013 on the Today Show, and uh, she said, I think we've had enough Bushes and enough Clintons. So jo Jeb Bush, who is by then has not announced he's running but is moving toward running, is watching this on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and he had not been aware that this was coming and in fact, um, I said to her, I asked Barbara Bush, Did you, were you trying to send him a message? And she said, no, I was just answering her question, <laughs> which I think is probably right. I think it probably wasn't calculated. Jeb Bush was not delighted by this uh, exchange. <laughs> and so he called his mother and said, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, an American icon, his own mother has basically said he shouldn't run for this job he's about to run for. And she said she wouldn't do it again. She didn't apologize for it <laughs> because it in fact was what she thought. But she said she wouldn't say it again. So Jeb Bush then, a couple weeks later, is watching C-SPAN. And there's his mother on C-SPAN saying, well, we've had enough Bushes and enough Clintons <laughs> this time. And so he calls her not a little hotter than the first time around saying, you promised me you wouldn't say that again. And she said, I didn't, and hung up on him. <laughs> <laughs> and she then said, uh, and he's, he, I think, I, then, I don't know if he called her back immediately, but uh, he got back in touch with her, saying, I just saw this on television. And it turned out that the C-SPAN interview had been conducted weeks earlier before the Today Show interview. So the fact is, it sounded like she had made, said the same thing, but it, she hadn't said it, it's just that it was aired after that. 
But you know, you look back at where we stand here in 2019, Barbara Bush was right. You know, in many ways the country had enough Bushes and enough Clintons and were ready for somebody new. Uh, I mean, that's, that is a sign of her sharp political judgment and also her blunt willingness to answer a question that's posed to her. Well, speaking of the Clintons, we had Bill kick us off uh, with the uh, story of what she said uh, should George lose in <laughs> 1988. But what was it like for her, and for him, but particularly for her, when they lost the re-election campaign in 92 to Bill Clinton? So they were both um, distressed, as you might uh, think. I mean, of course, any candidate is when he or she loses an election. They were particularly distressed because they thought he had lost to a lesser man. <laughs> They were surprised that the country was willing to elect uh, somebody who had dodged the draft, somebody about whom there were all these allegations of personal misbehavior, and choose him over George Bush, a hero from World War II. Um, so it took, I think, I think it took George Bush some time to get over this. I don't think George Bush got 100% over it until his son was elected president, and then I think he was fine with it, but it was hard for a guy as competitive as him. She was, in fact, I think, uh, very happy to move on with her lives. Uh, she, was, she liked being in the White House, but she also liked the idea of going back home to Houston. Uh, they had bought this narrow lot that reporters had repeatedly said they would never build a house on, and that it was just a scam to claim that as their address. So of course, they built a house on that <laughs> lot, proving us all wrong. Um, she became you know, engaged back in things. She, she bought a car. In her diary, she complains about how much the car costs. <laughs> uh, she, they bought a Mercury Sable, which is a kind of a mid-range car, and she said, for that price, we should have been able to get a Mercedes. <laughs> she, said, she said, you can't believe, you go to the grocery store and it costs you $100 to get three bags of groceries. These, this is a sense of how Americans live their lives that would have helped George Bush during the 1992 campaign if they had conveyed a little better understanding of the pressures Americans were under. but in any case, she was, she was, I think, not unhappy about getting back with her, her family and her friends and spending time with her children and her grandchildren. Um, uh, and she did, she did something, she, she did several interesting things that were not, I think, publicized, certainly were not publicized at the time. One thing she did was she waived Secret Service protection um, because she thought it was unnecessary and it, you know, she it made her less, able to move around and it seemed like a waste of taxpayer money. This wasn't announced, of course, because it would have raised security issues um, if, uh, if everybody in the world knew that she no longer was taking secret service protection. She didn't take it back until the 9-11 attacks. Um, but doesn't that say something nice about her? And I don't, so far as I know, no other first lady has ever done that. I mean, even in the final years of Mrs. Johnson's life, um, I know that she had secret service details with her. So. That was pretty, so she was, she adjusted faster than he did. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, having covered, I've, I've got here six White House, mm -hmm. and um, you've interviewed the past nine presidents. I have, yeah. Um, I have no other skills. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good one to have, I would say, and a great record. Uh, tell us, after having done this book and studied so in depth a first lady, what is your sense of, putting her in the context of the other presidents you've studied mm -hmm. and the other first ladies you've seen, not written books on, but seen up close and personal. Um, what should that role be? How have you seen it evolve over your time in covering the White House? So I think this is one of those roles that doesn't evolve. I think it is particular to each first lady and to each couple, first couple. Um, and I think that Americans are actually pretty willing to let first ladies do what, how they want to define their roles. Because Melania Trump, um, has defined a very different role as first lady than our other modern first lady. She's much less involved in kind of the, you know, she, she does have an, an issue. She, she, she's just less active. She does fewer events. She travels less often, although she travels some. Um, and Americans are pretty supportive of that. But they were also pretty supportive of, of, uh, of Barbara Bush being much more active or of uh, Michelle Obama uh, taking causes and, and pursuing them with a lot of activity. They were. The, the, the one first lady in the time I've covered the White House that I think caused, uh, had, um, had a lot of Americans didn't like so much was Hillary Clinton. And I think that was because she was taking a very active role in a way that seemed more like a staffer than a spouse, in a way that we really weren't accustomed to as a country. And so I think that 
created some issues for President Clinton. Um, and it's one of the things that Barbara Bush also wrote about in her diary that she thought that uh, she, she, she questioned, she said, I wonder whether Americans are ready for this style of first lady. Um, and I think in, in retrospect, Americans were not quite ready for a first lady who was the person who was in charge of drawing up the, the important health care plan for the Clinton administration. But you know, you look at um, Hillary, you look at Barbara Bush or at Nancy Reagan, they were hugely influential in ways that were not recognized. And that was one of the conclusions in my book. Um, Karen Tumulty from the Washington Post is now doing a biography of Nancy Reagan. And I'll be really interested to see in her book what she discovers about the ways in which Nancy Reagan was an influential figure in her husband's administration too. Let me ask before we turn to the audience one policy question. And you started uh, your comments today so poignantly about Robin Bush's death and the impact that it had uh, on both the Bushes, but particularly Mrs. Bush. You write very compellingly in your book about the impact that Robin's death had on Mrs. Bush's view of abortion mm. and how Mrs. Bush wrote about that in her diary. Could you tell us about that? So this was one extraordinary moment. So I'm going through these diaries um, at the Bush Library where they're not, no one's allowed to read them for th until 35 years after her death. So it'll be a while. And they haven't been read even by the archivists. They haven't been sorted. They haven't been processed. Mm -hmm. They're just in these big, they're he kept in this cage and they're in these big bins. So, or, you know, uh, cardboard boxes. Um, not, I mean, not like you get from U-Haul. I mean, they're like <laughs> library. Archival. Or, or, I think they're they archival, call those archival, thank, boxes. archival boxes. Thank you. Fancy <laughs> boxes, but they're still boxes. <laughs> boxes. Um, and they would bring them out and, you know, there'd be duplications, they'd be out of order. I mean, it was really so, so much fun to go through them. So she kept her diary in different ways. And during the 1980 campaign, she had a, um, a leather bound book that was basically a calendar. And that was how she kept her diary then during the 1980 campaign. And so I, I, I'm reading through this 1980 campaign diary and out falls a letter that she had written to herself. So it's a four page letter that's on yellowing paper that's folded over and tucked in this diary. And at the top of it, it says, thoughts about abortion. And it is her effort to sort through what she thinks about abortion. Because her husband was gonna run for president, abortion was a big issue, uh, she knew she would be asked about it, and she wanted to figure out what she thought. And there was not a word in this, these four pages about the politics of abortion. There was nothing about what is convenient or defensible about abortion. It was entirely about what did she think morally about the issue of abortion. And in it, she comes back to Robin, and she writes, I was there, I mean, she didn't say I was there, that would be very good. She says, I, I remember at the moment of Robin's birth, I felt her soul enter her body. And I was there at the instant of Robin's death and I felt her soul leave her body. And if your soul enters your body at the moment of birth, then abortion is not murder and it shouldn't be up to the government. It should be up to a woman and, woman and her doctor. And you can, you can disagree with the conclusion she made on this, but you cannot question how sincerely she was trying to figure out what this issue, what she thought about this issue. And that was a perspective, she, she kept that opinion on abortion for the rest of her life. Now there was a time when she stopped being willing to discuss it because it was politically difficult for her husband. So from the time George Bush went on the ticket in 1980 until he left the White House, she refused to address questions about abortion. But in her 1994 memoir, which I see a copy of right here. Um, she does talk about her views on abortion. So that was just such an, ex that was an, ex these poor archivists. So the, the rules in the archives are very strict, as you know, <laughs> annoyingly so. So you can't bring anything in there. You have to use their paper, their blue paper, their pencils. Um, you can't take a picture of anything. And also there was a person assigned to be with me while I go through the diary. So I guess so I don't like rip something out or try to steal something. I can understand that, but what a boring job that poor, <laughs> that poor guy had all that time. And I would be, and these are diaries that the archivists have not 
been allowed to read. So I'd be sitting there crying and laughing and <laughs> gasping, and this poor archivist would be watching me like, I mean. Only 34 years Yeah, 34 more years, to go. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions? We have, I think, a microphone that it will be coming around to you. So who would like to throw out the first question from the audience? Yes, here. Wait, if you'll wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. It, it's not so much a question as a comment. I uh, was at Sloan Kettering from 1983 to 1988, and the Bushes came and visited and uh, endowed a, a, a portion devoted to leukemia. Uh, and she was very active, but he was the president, and so much more attention to him. But. Um, she, I never thought of this until you spoke, um, because I was sort of focused on him at the time. <laughs> um, but we had at Memorial Sloan Kettering about 10% of all the AIDS patients in, America, uh, in New York that were hospitalized. And it was because we knew a lot about unusual infections, because chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant patients were very susceptible. Uh, to that, and because there are some cancers that are uh, more likely. And everything you said about not touching and concern for AIDS patients was very much true, mm. not of only of the people, but of the nursing staff, mm. the doctors. We had anesthesiologists who wouldn't give anesthesia because of blood and all of this, and it uh, was an awkward time. Hmm. And she, and this is what I, you reminded me of, uh, was very interested in what we were doing about AIDS. It was an mm -hmm. original celebration yeah. of, or oh, not celebration, but uh, concern about leukemia and awards. That's why she came. She didn't come about AIDS, but she focused on mm -hmm. AIDS, and I, I got that just yeah. hearing you now. You know, I think she took some lessons. Thank you for that perspective. I think she took um, some lessons from that very, I think she took many lessons from that very sad experience. And there was a point when George Bush came back from China, where he'd been the top US envoy, to take over the CIA. And this was a very difficult time for Barbara Bush, and she fell into a serious depression. Uh, she contemplated suicide. She told me that she would be, uh, driving down the highway and think about plowing, how easy it would be to plow into a tree. She would think, maybe I could steer my car into the path of this oncoming car because she wanted to die. And there were complicated reasons why this was a difficult time for her. But, and she got over it, she came out of this depression after about six months. And I asked her what helped her come out of it. And um, she said she wasn't entirely sure. She never sought treatment. She never told anybody except her husband. Her brother, Scott, with whom she was very close, um, basically disputed my, when I asked him about it, that it was such a serious thing, even though she had told me she contemplated suicide because it was at such odds with her image as being this kind of strong, confident woman. But she said one thing that helped her come out of this depression was she went and volunteered at what was then called the Washington Home for the Incurables which is now I think called the Washington Hospice Center, the Washington Hospital and Hospice Center. Um, and that, that helped her. And I guess, I think one lesson she took was, if you're in a rough patch, find somebody who's in a rougher patch and help them, and maybe that'll help you too. Other questions, please? Thank you. Um, on Sunday morning, when I see that uh, Susan is going to be on Face a Nation, <laughs> I skip church so I can listen to it. So I was predisposed to enjoy this book, which I read with great pleasure. And people often said that my mother was a lot like Barbara Bush. So reading the book was really a thrill. And I just want to congratulate you. It's a great read. And everybody in this room <laughs> would enjoy reading. It was really terrific. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, cousin. You, yeah. Thank you for saying that, because we have copies available. Yeah. So when you exit and 
take a little bow to Mrs. Scott on your way to purchase a book, and it's never too early for Christmas shopping. Remember and, uh, that and have it wonderfully inscribed. Don't tell season. God about the whole <laughs> yes. face thing. <laughs> uh, but it is a religious experience in its own right. <laughs> yes, sir, we have a question up here toward the front of the room. Could you talk a little about the experience in China? Mm -hmm. Was that like a vacation from <laughs> politics, or was it... I'm just curious because yeah. that is not talked about very much. So you know, I think it I think it was a respite because for for George Bush because you know he had been head of the RN he had been at the UN which he liked very much and so did she and then he had taken over the RNC during during Watergate which was not such a great experience mm -hmm. uh, that was a, you can imagine being Republican chairman defending Richard Nixon up to the point where he was clearly going to be impeached so that had been a that had been a tough time. And they then talked to President, he then talked to President Ford about what else he could do. He was clearly gonna get some reward for having done the RNC. And he could have had like uh, a better, dip, better diplomatic posting like in, I don't know, I don't know, London or Paris or Rome or someplace like that. And he was very interested in going to China because he thought it was interesting. And it was also a way. You know, it was much farther away than it is now because now we've got so many more ways to communicate. It was really uh, isolated in a way. We didn't have diplomatic relations. He wasn't a officially an, an ambassador. Um, and she describes that as one of the happiest times of her life. And I think that's one, one thing that was fascinating to be in China then. And for another, it was like they were, it was like a time apart. And then uh, Kissinger called and said that, uh, Ford wanted to name him to take over the CIA job, which was the CIA had been under terrible fire, had been, you know, uh, big scandals that Congress had been exploring with the CIA. And Barbara Bush, who told her husband not to take the RNC job, told him not to take the CIA job. And it was, in fact, kind of divert for somebody who really wanted to be president. We didn't have a history of take looking to the CIA for our next president. But he felt kind of an obligation when a president asked, so he came back and took took the CIA job. But I think they, they were in China about a year. Um, and I, and I, think they, I think they actually both liked it very much. And there's a wonderful book called The China Diaries, which is George Bush's diaries uh, from China that Jeffrey Engel did um, that, uh, is, that was a, for that period of time, was a good resource for me in doing this book. Other questions? I have a question. Yes, can you hold just until we get the, uh, because we're, we're putting this out. Uh, for those who can't be in the room with us today, so if you'll speak into the microphone, we'll appreciate it, and they will too. I have always, I have always found the relationship between the living presidents fascinating, mm -hmm. because so many of the participants beat the tar out <laughs> of others. <laughs> and I'm wondering, what was their relationship sitting in a room in Houston or whatever, and just chatting about the events of the day, and Mrs. Bush, what did she have to referee any <laughs> arguments? <laughs> well, I'll tell you about. Let me tell you about uh, uh, a phone call between Nancy Reagan and Barb Bush after they were both out of the White House. So um, there'd been this crushing defeat in 1992 uh, for George Bush, and so the inauguration. In, on January of, of uh, 19, uh, 1990, 1993, thank you, was uh, a painful time for them, right? But they did, the, they did the right thing, went there. They went and got on the plane that used to be Air Force One, but it wasn't anymore because he wasn't president anymore to fly them back to Houston, uh, where they were mad enough that they did not allow a press pool go with, to go with them, which was very unusual and quite out of step with their general attitude with the press, which was good. So that's it. So while they're flying back to Houston, on uh, Barbara Walters on ABC, there's some discussion with Barbara, I think it was Peter Jennings and Barbara Walters and some others, about how uh, Nancy Reagan hadn't treated Barbara Bush very well in terms of letting her see the family quarters of the White House after George Bush had won the White House. So it wasn't a big deal, but they talked a little about that. So Nancy Reagan sees this and gets really mad and calls in to ABC and insists on talking on the air to Barbara Walters. <laughs> so this is so great. So in, the, in this bizarre interview where you have the disembodied voice of Nancy Reagan on the phone <laughs> disputing the fact that they had ever done anything wrong to the Bushes, 
And by the way, the Bushes hadn't even, uh, they hadn't even treated Ronald Reagan very well, bringing him back to the White House. Now, in fact, Ronald Reagan had come back to the White House 10 days earlier to get an award from George Bush, so this wasn't true. But she was clearly kind of trying to, you know, settle the score, combat whatever negative thing had been said before. So this had caused mostly a rolling of eyes uh, on the air, and then she hung up. But uh, a reporter for the New York Times wrote a story about it. This was somebody who was then working as a reporter. Uh, her name was Maureen Dowd. <laughs> and she wrote a story about this bizarre phone call that Nancy Reagan had made to, to Barbara Walters on the air uh, about this, this clearly grievances going back years and how perplexed. So that was, so the Bushes then, so it's before social media, so it's not like everything gets immediately accessible the way it is. The next morning, the Bushes, who have moved into a rented house in Houston, get the New York Times and see this worrying down story with this bizarre Nancy Reagan thing in it. And this was the kind of thing Nancy Reagan had done. You know, Nancy Reagan may have her own side of things, but I was doing a book on Barbara Bush, and so I'm telling you Barbara Bush's side of things. Nancy Reagan <laughs> had been pulling this kind of stuff for years. So the next day, Nancy Reagan calls Barbara Bush in Houston, which was her what she often did in these occasions to try to explain away whatever she had done that had pissed off Barbara Bush. So Barbara Bush refused to take the call. <laughs> so the next day, Nancy Reagan calls again. And the White House operator, and Barbara Bush wasn't going to take the call. And the White House operator said, well, Mrs. Bush, aren't you going to take Mrs. Reagan's call? And she said, OK. So Nancy Reagan gets on the phone, does what she often would do, with, which was to explain that, you know, it's really misunderstood. Here was what I really meant. Let me explain what I meant. And Barbara Bush, at this point, had had enough of Nancy Reagan and was no longer in the White House herself. And so she said, I've had enough of your explaining. Uh, you know, there are reporters out here ask, at my door asking me questions about what you said. Now, this was a total lie, because there were no reporters at your door. No one cared, right? It was only Maureen Dowd and Barbara Bush who cared about this. Uh, she said, but she said, but she knew this would bother Nancy Reagan. Uh, so she said, there are reporters at my door asking me about this. Um, I don't want your explaining anymore. Uh, uh, don't ever call me again. And then she said, oh, my other phone is ringing. Also a lie. And she hung <laughs> up. <laughs> and they never had another extended conversation. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, Christmas, we are coming. <laughs> birthdays, <laughs> Mother's Day, Father's Mother's Day. Day. Right. We're coming to the end of our time. I just ask one question. Sure. <laughs> Wait, but we need to get you on the microphone. Sorry, but we need to have everybody here. Don't ask. Don't yet. You have to wait. I'm, I'm not disobeying Barbara. Just, if you could just touch on the books that Barbara wrote during or out of the presidency. I, from my perspective, I think it's just about the dogs. But why didn't she, why didn't, and maybe I'm wrong. Also, why did she not pick something more significant, such as a treatise to Robin or a treatise to age, AIDS, which she was so concerned about? Thank you. You know, n number one, she would dispute the idea that her dogs were not important. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she, loved, she loved her dogs. Um, she had, at the end of her life, she had these two, two of the meanest dogs you've ever met. <laughs> these two little dogs. They, the, the first time you walk in the door, she'd say, don't touch the dogs, because, you know, they would bite you. They, in fact, bit, bit George W. Bush, most, much to much his annoyance. <laughs> When she died, no one wanted to take the dogs. Uh, <laughs> finally, a volunteer uh, at the Bush Library agreed to take the dogs. But anyway, she, 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 loved, her, she loved her dogs. And she, the, the books she wrote about her dogs were fundraisers for her literacy efforts. So the, the proceeds from the two very popular books, one, one book was somewhat popular, but the second book was very popular. It all went to support the literacy efforts, which was, in fact, her big public effort, as you know, uh, when she was first lady and afterwards. Um, you know, I think, that, I think that people underestimated Barbara Bush. I think Barbara Bush underestimated herself. I think Barbara Bush did not understand, didn't fully appreciate the impact that she had had on things, um, and the fact that people would have been interested in hearing her thoughts about the impact of her daughter's death, 
um, or about other aspects of her life. She was stunned when her book, her memoir, the one that you have in your hand, became a bestseller. She was delighted, but she was also surprised. So to keep us all on the edge of our seats until Susan's next book, <laughs> in true Miller Center fashion of bipartisanship, <laughs> she's switching to a lifelong Democrat woman, Nancy Pelosi. So her next book will be on that. And we can't, and given how quickly Susan writes, she'll be back in a couple of years, I presume, uh, and talk about that. So uh, please, please, please thank Susan for being here today. so generous in her encomia for our oral history program. On November 1st, in this room, we are going to reveal the Bush 43 oral history. Oh. So we've done 91 interviews. We're up to about a third of those having been cleared and readied when we flip the switch on November 1st. And we'll have several panels uh, consisting of scholars and Bush 43 alums. Uh, and we'll hope that you'll come back for that and the many programs in between. Thanks again. See you all next time. Thank you.